Um, Jim Conway is the chairman of the Society. He's a professionally qualified OCM guide and he's been taking tours for many years around Lurgan and he's created and written a heritage walking tour about AEs like Lurgan. So maybe next year you get doing that walk if you haven't already done so. I'll introduce Michael McKernan. Michael's the treasurer of the George Russell Society in Lur North Lur and Lurgan, North Alabama. And Michael has curated a lovely collection of A. E. Russell's portrait. And um, the book is on sale this weekend, as you know. And Michael has also co authored a previous book, which is a great contribution to the material on A. E. And it's called George Russell, A. E. Lurgan, and North Armagh. But I'd like to introduce it. Well, I've introduced the guys, and um, if you want to make a start. Well, just before I start, I think it's going to be short and sweet, you'll be glad to hear it. But uh, I would like to thank all those involved in the organising uh, at this weekend. It's been absolutely fantastic. It's blown me away. Um, and the amount of new and fresh ideas and fresh people that's come in, and the content of some of the speakers and what they did. It, 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 I think the organisation is very healthy, and I think it has some powerful potential in order to go forward. And, uh, the big talk's going to be a sort of follow-on um, from the walking tour, you know. Um, it was supposed to be about poetry, but I'm going to finish up a bit of A's poetry, which gave me the idea for, for this. So, so th this is the, the Lincoln Chambers, and uh, uh, if you move it on to the next slide here. Uh, as you can see there, Patricia Boylan was the, the lady that wrote the book on the United Arts Club. And uh, she said uh, the book was called All Cultivated People. And she wrote that the Lincoln Chambers was uh, the flat roof building beside Lincoln Gate of Trinity College opposite the Turkish Baths. And um, around the corner from Weston Row Station, it was also close to the National Gallery, Marion Square and Fitzwilliam Squares, and was actually accidentally situated for the convenience of A's friends, uh, whose interests constantly brought them to these areas. It was an ideal address from which to launch the United Arts Club. It was also from the Lincoln Chamber that A.E. produced the Irish Homestead, which Patricia Boylan describes as the ashram of Dublin's intelligentsia. So <clears throat> you can see that the, you know the, the massive connection, and, and it, it's undoubtedly without the help of the United Arts Club, we, we wouldn't be able to, to bring uh, this organisation and what we have done forward, you know. And, I think that explains the close connection A.E. had to United Arts Club, because she said, basically they formed it for A.E.'s friends, that's what she said, so um, we can only take that at face value, and um, I'd like to pay homage and thank United Arts Club for all the hard work that they did, and certainly we wouldn't be in the position we are without them. So, that's so I think the, the next slide is one of the baths, is it? The Turkish baths? We'll find out. No, no, no. I had one of the Turkish baths, but it seems it disappeared. So this is one of the most important locations in uh, in Joyce's uh, life, mm -hmm. and certainly Ulysses. Um, so <coughs> really, uh, this is at the other end, really, of, of the Lincoln buildings. And Joyce, for 1902, Joyce had been visiting me and taking a lot of advice from him. And, uh, so, uh, on the fateful day that, as you can see there, one of the important Joyce Inn locations, Flynn's Hotel, Nassau Street, where Nora Bargill was staying when Joyce first met her, on the afternoon of the 10th of June 1904. The sign is still there, when you go down, you can see it still, um, in 94. It's on the gable of the farm hotel, the workplace of Nora Bargill, who was a chambermaid. Uh, Joyce had an affinity with the Lincoln's Inn, where he was known to wait for Nora until she finished her shift. In Finns, and it's almost certain that he was getting there to meet AE. He was going to meet AE, and then he would come and look for Nora after that. So, you know, what I'm saying is, earlier we said that I think he adored AE. You know, he, he, he par partied him, and AE wouldn't have minded people partying him, you know, making fun of him uh, and a sort of comical figure. But he, he, he uses really powerful words, you know, to describe him that Latin word, uh, or something like this, which means 
the gatekeeper or the good shepherd. Who was quite open to the world for, for, for Joyce, you know. And he mentions it more than anybody right throughout it, you know. Uh, throughout. So, so it wouldn't have happened, the whole Joyce and thing wouldn't have really happened without it. Uh, and going with me there either, you know. So George, Joyce, Joyce's Dublin begins in 1904 when uh, George, George Russell invited Joyce to write something simple for the Irish homestead in order to make it a little easy. Uh, so he earned money from that and of course um, A he had paid, paid him first up front and uh, uh, that's really why he read A E A O E. So he had started writing his literary career and he'd let them, them uh, or given them money to read uh, which became the Dubliners. So uh, next slide. Uh, this is the Turkish pass. That should have been up there. Mm. So you can read, but if you can see those Turkish baths were absolutely beautiful anyway, you know. It's pretty, a lot of this uh, architecture has disappeared from Dublin. Like. It's now an office block. An office block, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then next slide. Yeah. So, <clears throat> this is where Maud Gaughan lived, Colson Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually the house that I lived in. Maud Gaughan lived beside A, and Maud Gaughan, I'm sure you know, was one of those. Uh, great characters from Dublin at the time, and uh, so what really happened was uh, there was a, an English king coming to visit, and Maud Gaughan thought this was a terrible thing for the people to welcome this English king coming. So she organised this little group to protest about this. In fact, um, uh, all her neighbours had out uh, Union Jacks flags again. And, she had a lovely pair of black bloomers, and she hung the, she hung the, the black bloomers out. So, uh, there's, a, there's two claims of what they were supposed to represent. One is that she had hung it out for a pope, the Pope had day at the time, and it was mourning for the Pope. Somehow I don't think it was a was mourning for the Pope. But a lot of her friends had died in the, the, the Boer War. Of course, her husband was involved in that, her future husband was involved in that as well. So this was known as the Battle of Colston Avenue, and uh, so when she hung that out, the, the RIC and all came to try and take it down, and the England and the Hearn were protecting it, and Valet, A.E.'s wife, and A.E. were trying to calm things down. She was running about with a, a gun. Now, uh, it's been said the gun was actually, it wasn't a real gun, it was a later, but nobody really knows it. May have really it. So she was running about this gun flat with the, the police and all that. Total crazy uh, scenario. That little gathering there, we, we go on to form uh, what became Sinn Féin, you know. So uh, Seamus, Seamus McManus and all wrote about Maud Gaughan summoning, her, summoning him until the meeting and all the things they got there. So I love, yeah, Arthur Griffiths was another one was part of that there. So that, that is actually the embryo of uh, Sinn Féin, that, that meeting in her house. So um, I think I've, I've not covered most of it, have I? And, uh, so A he lived right beside him. So and uh, Curtis Markovich lived around the corner as well from, from that location. So it's close to Avenue. If you ever get a chance to go <coughs> the house is still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were we were visiting that location today. Um, the girl come back me. Um, and, and your place is full of all of her art, which is fantastic. I don't know when you were in the United Arts when you, on the tables, uh, underneath the tables, all these McNee. Like, Copies, uh, copies, but there was, was there not some original thing on the wall or something? No? Yeah, we have the originals on upstairs. Yeah, there's a hanging on the yeah. one. So, yeah. so, so, so we've taken good care of the original. Well, they're fantastic to have, you know, they really are, because she was a fantastic <coughs> artist. And, uh, and so, and this sort of sums up the friendship and the relationship they had, where, you know, even Yeats himself would have said that. He was an Oregon, he was, he was proud to be Oregon, you know, and uh, he, he moved, uh, usually moved, at some, and got the clue as close as he could to AE, and obviously he moved two down, four down from AE. Um, when they were first starting out, um, he bounced out AE for his first ten years of his poetic life. So you can see a lot of influences between AE and, and Yeats, and Yeats and AE, you know. Like it was AE who first mentioned being buried underneath Ben Baldwin, you know, and one of the Yeats' most famous lines. So the two of them were always sharing ideas, bouncing off each other. And Yeats certainly, I mean, when he was living in Marion Square, he moved, uh, or when he was using the Marion Square, he used two, two doors down from it. And this is representing 
the two of them were coming to meet each other. And he is coming along and he's contemplating things and looking at the ground and he's his uh, head in the air looking in the air. And the two of them each other, they haven't really used to pass each other and they get to their houses and he says, Well, come to visit me. And, and he's told them he is what to visit him like, you know. So, so that's that's the, the Burning Square. And so she also wrote one called The Celebrity Zoo. And uh, Yeats had sort of almost campaigned for, for his, uh, his, uh, his award, you know, for to get the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, so she, did, she was realised, you know, that this, he had pushed to get this really. And, uh, so she de depicted the Nobel Prize as a giraffe, you know, and she, she really parried this whole thing where, uh, and his connection. So as you can see there, the character in the picture Eats and George walking past 83 Marion Square. Eats had moved there uh, to 82, to a close day, uh, and as I said, passage. And the celebrity Zoo, McNee Eats, uh, is now owner of the Ireland's first Nobel Prize, and she depicts it as a camel. Eats has his nose in the air, just as he does in chin angles, and McNee both mocks and reinforces the idea of Eats as celebrity in the camel. And she wrote this, writes this wee poem to go with it. As you survey this camel with surprise, you reckon I'm sure it's near heaven and its toes. So, I think this is A.E. the burr here, right? That's the camel, and that's Yeats. And uh, so, she depicts A.E. as a burr, and I've seen a few references to A.E. as a burr, you know. This big cuddly burr, people talk about the big cuddly burr. And so this is what you wrote here. Uh, Though you might think this beast was mostly her, a poet lays concealed behind its fur. If, like most others, you revere this burr, at calling it a beast, you will demur. More for its fur, in manner capitalistic, contains in one a poet, seer, and mystic. So you can see how much you loved them, and the contrast. With it. This is what we're telling you. You know, Yeats wasn't wasn't the you know very well liked. He loved as a poet, of course, but as a person, he wasn't. Um, it wasn't <laughs> very well liked, whereas he was uh, universally loved, you know. So of course this is uh, Rathgar Avenue, which is around the corner from Colson Avenue, and uh, this is a wee poem that he wrote about uh, Rathgar. What miracle was it that made this grey Rathgar seem holy earth, a leaping place from star to star? I know I strode along grey streets. This consulate, seeing nowhere a glimmer of the glittering gate, my vision baffled amid my dreams, for still the early walls rose up in fabulous hill on hill. Now somebody asked about the a blue plaque, wasn't there? Was somebody going on about a blue plaque? Mm. But it was a committee got together and put that plaque up. That's not that wasn't erected by, by, by the council. It wasn't erected by the council, no, it was a committee erected that. And, uh, so Probably because the council weren't actually, in fact it was the um, tourism people who used to do it way in the past and then the council took over the responsibility for that on day about 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, so this place became, as, as Raymond was saying, this was the Mecca for people to come to a saloons. Was you, uh, was you sat with you, uh, Patrick mentioned the saloon. So this is the place where all these people came. Yeah, he's uh, saloons, um, and uh, in, in the census uh, for Seventeen Rathgar Avenue in 1968, 1906, he was living there with his wife Alan and their sons Brian and Jeremy. During the 1911 census, under the heading occupation, he wrote "artist writer" with the words "oil paintings" added underneath, as if to affirm this statement. Now. <coughs> A.E.'s e. earlier works were, were, were mostly um, chalk or, you know, uh, what do you call it? Crayon. Crayon. You know, that type of thing. Uh, uh, charcoal. Charcoal. charcoal and things like that. So later on, when he met, met the, the Margarites, he started the painting oil paints. And that, you could sort of date some of his stuff. Michael has a beautiful one of the Three Graces. Now, the Three Graces struck me, they were in, in, uh, in, the, in the Marion Square, wasn't it? When we were walking through, there were three graces there as well. And uh, I don't know, you want to talk about that painting? 
Not really, because I don't know what it's about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but we'll move on then. Well, 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 you well, 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 come on. Uh, <laughs> and as I said, we came up a, a Mac up for the, all the poets and the writers and all of the time. And he, he, his hospitality uh, was highly regarded. Um, so it, it was the, the sort of base of his. You know, like people like Kavanagh, Waddell, Han Waddell, Lady Gregory, P.L. Travers, and young James Joyce, called Bernard Shaw, the whole lot of them they came to, to listen to these songs that Patrick was talking about. And uh, so, and we'll move on to another one. So this is uh, now the Western Hotel, uh, number three and four in uh, College Street. And uh, we have your good vegetarian. And this is where the vegetarian restaurant was mm -hmm. that they all went to, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was set up by an anthro man, some events in an anthro man early on. And uh, it was associated with uh, Robin Tagore, people like that probably would have visited this when they were here. And maybe they even had dinner with they either, you know. Um, so the Hindu upper caste people visited there as well. So this is where, it's a very interesting story here where Bloom thinks that A.E. and Lizzie Twig have come from the college hotel restaurant. Uh, in the Kagi restaurant at number three College Street. It has now been absorbed into the Westland Hotel. Uh, and so A, he was convinced, a convinced vegetarian and was an aesthetically preferable as it was to blunder the slaughter. It's funny somebody was talking about, you know, he had de developed some way of butchering cattle here, even though he detested butchering cattle, you know. I just heard that early on and I just thought, a wee bit strange there that he was but anyway, but he was probably seeing that as an economic economist rather than his, you know, his belief system. The Zays followed the hay figure, the homespun beard, the basic. This is this is out of uh, this is. Uh, a listening woman at a say, coming from the vegetarian, only wiggy wobbles and fruit. Don't eat a beef steak. If you do, the A's of that cow will pursue you through all eternity. They, th they say it is healthier. When the worry though, try to keep you on the run all day. Bad as a bloater, dreams all night. Why do they call that thing they give me nut steak? Not terrians, fruitarians. To give you that idea that you're eating rum steak. Of sword salty to you. They cook in soda. Keep you sitting up by the tap all night. So when Bloom sees A.E. with Lizzie Twig, it is the fact that they are vegetarians, that their brains might be formed differently, that makes him hurt, that their physical appearances and their intellectual conversation. Conversely, you cannot imagine that the sweating constables, so he sees these police constables, uh, he saw earlier who at Star Stew can write any poetry at all. So that when Bloom chooses to eat a cheese sandwich, he is temporarily endorsing a group that does not kill flesh and thereby feels superior. Uh, cannibals such as these that uh, Mr. McTrigger believe they take on the attributes of the person they are eating. At the time, it was culturally fashionable to be a vegetarian if one belonged to the literary Dublin circle. The Dublin Vegetarian Restaurant became a rendezvous for, for all the A's friends, also the leaders of a vegetarian literary set. And so they all met there. These include the few Hindu vegetarians who were residing in Dublin for studies. The A critiqued Aaron's animal based products and conservation as the threats to Aaron's ability to achieve full independence. So Homer's lotus eaters were vegetarians, as were many Buddhists, eating only flowers. Bloom associates vegetarianism and the uh, history with mysticism and with theosophy. A. E. Russell, Ulysses alludes to A.E.'s pacifism by equating it with his vegetarianism and this Lystri Jonians, where Pierce is a carnivore, so he is quitting Patrick Pierce's violence uh, as, as cannibalism. Uh, Bloom was on a tightrope walk between the Scylla and the Charbelies of A.E. and Pierce. Both of them are attractive options, but neither quite right. And so finally, you were glad to know, A.E. wrote uh, a lovely poem, Remembering Sackville Street in 1916. Uh, the last year at Easter, there were faces pale and bright. So that's A.E.'s line. The red one is Yeats's line. It is likely these lines he put Sorry, that's me writing the mm -hmm. book, Jesus' poem, Easter 1916. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces. So you can see the, the, the comment. So A, he wrote that, his name, Paul Yeats. 
So he eats his bites and alley and getting his eight ears from. So that's the rest of the poem. The Lord has risen from the grave, uh, which was fear. Hearts were early, eyes filled with inner hate. It was wrought this miracle among the ruins here. Among the ruins here at Easter year old. The time is immortal, and for a sheaf of ours, it was fearful, willful, and laughing, though on it broke. The wrath of the Iron Age. So uh, this is why I was asking the question about the Iron Age earlier on. You know, this I believe that this industrialization of the human spirit and of you know, the people, uh, he was really, really against this Iron Age. The weight of the Iron Powers, they were not vanquished, the stars were on their side. The host of stars that glitter above their heavenly gold, they see as torch from torch is kindled, the fires flash away. A host of kingling spirits in the dark of iron and soul. Next one. So before 1924, Dublin's main street, now known as O'Connell Street, was called Sackville Street. Most Dubliners would have spent some time each week, as they still do today, coming and going around the street. This is where in 1916 rebels focused their activities. The GPO building and the Imperial Hotel, uh, well the Imperial Hotel is where the story plow uh, mm. was raised. Although, in saying that, that flag was, was uh, it had changed from being the blue one and they also to a green and gold one. Uh, so, uh, of the balance, well the many armies were firing shells from a worship at the time. So he continued to pass through this area to get to his printers and carry out other routine activities which were not suspended when the battle was fought. So I'll conclude then. Thank you very much. The three graves. The three graves. The graves before, the graves after. The graves before, the graves after. The graves before, the graves after. I think that, uh, well, firstly, well done everybody for staying, mm. staying the distance. Yeah. A great show of stamina, and uh, hopefully I'm not tested <coughs> too much longer. Um, I'd also would like to echo uh, Jim's comments. Uh, it's been a fantastic weekend. Uh, well done to everyone involved in putting it together and, and uh, participating in it. And, uh, you know, I think it's been a fantastic success. And for some of us, it's also the cherry on the cake that they are mad but they got us down to the Colin or A.E. or whatever. <laughs> Married to Cambridge and something to do with it. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, we don't, I'm not going to do a big treat, I say there isn't time on, on the, you know, poetry on its own is a big subject, paintings on, on, on their own uh, are a big subject. So, uh, but I'll go through and give a flavour of how I would summarise it. Uh, we've had a lot of things over the weekend that describe A.E. And, and just how versatile he was and just um, how many dimensions there were to him. So I'm, uh, I'm not going to go through them all. But it is, it, it is um, if you start with this poetry, you do have to start with Yeats. And William Butler Yeats is two years older than A.E. when they met at art college. Um, Yeats wanted to be like his father, who was a brilliant portrait of painter uh, and uh, many of his paintings are in the National Gallery and many other institutions. But John Yates, uh, who incidentally was born just outside Lourdes, uh, was terrible with money, he was always broke mm -hmm. and no matter how good his art was he never made any money and um, Yates, but he brought his son, his whole family up, the talented family, Jack Yates, the sisters as well with Kuma Grace. Uh, Yates had a burning desire to to have a bohemian lifestyle and an artistic lifestyle. So his poetry, uh, it's mainly yeah, mystical, lyrical. It you know, uh, um, what was going on in his head was what, it, uh, and what was going on in his visions was what he wanted to get down on paper. Again, unlike Yeats, who was a craftsman and a wordsmith and who agonised over every word, a he would run it out quickly on the page and not even bother changing And there are areas where you can see the lack of craftsmanship. You can see that there's maybe, it looks like a syllable too many and, and that, type, that type of thing. And, and uh, I have it of repeating some things. But as Dan Hall said last night, uh, he was capable of producing some wonderful poetry at the same time. Um, and you can see the tributes of Yeats uh, and Don Saini, uh, 
had to, and at the time when he was at his peak writing poetry, he was not as well known as Yeats, who was making big headway in London, in the London literary set. But in Ireland, he was regarded as being on a par with Yeats, and the two of them way ahead of everybody else at that time. So, A's poetic, what uh, man was mentioned earlier, um, uh, his poetry in America was all about the closeness there, the primacy of nature, and A he bought into that, uh, and he had a great affinity for that. Uh, and because uh, farmers, peasants though they may be, were the custodians of the land, he regarded them as descendants of an ancient nobility, and he admired them. That's why he got on so well with them when he worked in the cooperative movement. He wasn't so pompous, Victorian man of letters descending among an uneducated peasantry. He was a guy who really got them and who wanted uh, the best for them. And of course, he wanted the best because you could see the poverty around rural Ireland and he wanted to change that. But probably most of all, the biggest influence in his poetry was the theosophical beliefs um, in universal brotherhood, duty to others, duty to self improve. A, he could very easily have been one of these contemplative, meditative people to go and hide in a cave somewhere and write things. Uh, he felt he had a duty in, in public life to go and do things for others. Um, and he also, the central the theosophical and also from the Indian uh, philosophies that. You could, he believed you could reach a higher plane of consciousness if you tried, and he set all that out brilliantly in the Candle Vision. Again, also influenced by Irish mythology, Stanley O'Grady has been mentioned. Um, so that, that's kind of the package of feelings and inclinations and uh, that, that drove A's work. And it drove everything. And I said it there that it's, um, it influences painting as well. There's a remarkable consistency just about everything he did, that those influences shaped uh, whether it was his work in the cooperative movement, his poetry, um, his paintings, um, and anything he did in public life and politics. Uh, and so that, that consisted. Now, we found over this weekend people come to a with um, maybe different preferences in among that lot. You know, Patrick's been brilliant to him. On the Theosophical, the Bhagavad Gita, the esoteric influences, uh, the spiritual and mystical. He saw Daniel Hall last night, much more interested in his contribution to public life, to politics, mm -hmm. political thought, um, and reckoned that had he applied himself more, those, those poems would be real standout poems. Some of them, in my view, are. Um, so, I mentioned that Yeats and, and A.E. collaborated, and even beyond their teenage years, they were writing to each other and they would send each other a poem. And uh, um, A, there's one famous one where A.E. sent uh, a poem to Yeats um, and asked him what he thought of it. And Yeats gave him a detailed critique, suggesting little amendments here and there, a word here, a word there. But he also told him to drop the last paragraph. And the poem is about um, a person lying by the side of the lake, falling, uh, falling asleep, and uh, as, as they sleep, out come the fairies, and the whole atmosphere changes, and uh, and it's called Carol Moore, or as they have a habit of doing, sometimes gave us poems two different titles at different times, um, or the gates of Greenland. Uh, I'm not going to read it out, but that's what the story was about. The sleeper at the lakeside, um, and, the, and the fairies coming out, and the atmosphere all changing. But Yeats told him to drop the last verse. A, he took on board one of the one or two of the little textual drafting changes. But Yeats said, "You don't need the last verse." And I, I just I look at it and I say, yeah, "Well, the great gates of the mountain have opened once again. The sound of song and dancing fall upon the ears of men, and the land of youth flies gleaming, flushed with rainbow light and mirth." And the old enchantment lingers in the honey heart of earth. Why would you drop that? It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, some of his poems were very, uh, very. And in fact, that old enchantment, honey heart of earth. I just borrowed that phrase, and the old enchantment lingers. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, there was a painting. I've linked a couple of paintings to some of these poems. That's a simple one. Uh, painting of uh, children dancing on the beach, frolicking of 
they were, and the poem Frolic appeared, it was part of the Northern Ireland um, English syllabus uh, some years ago. Um, and I'll not, not read it, but you know, the, it's a very simple little ditty, almost the whole of the world was merry, one joy from the dale to the height, where the blue woods of twilight encircled the lovely lawns of the light. Uh, Dama Hall referred to this last night, I'll not read it all, but uh, it showed his political, um, uh, the, the, how advanced his political thinking was. He recognised at a time when the, when the nation was rising, appalled at the cruel um, executions of the leaders of the 1916 Rising, uh, and there was a wave of sympathy for them that they gave their lives. There was no support for the Rising as it happened, but after the executions there was huge support for um, those people. But then he pointed out that while that was understandable, um, there was a lot of Irish people died, uh, albeit in British uniforms in the Great War at that time. And like it's taken Ireland a long, long time to recognise that. It's, it's only in relatively recent times that the Irish government has officially recognised that sacrifice. Um, and the way he did it was he had a, I think Dan only read the last verse, but the way he did it was he just had alternate verses. So the first one there is a, in a way a tribute to Pierce, the second one to uh, Alan Anderson, the third one to Thomas McDonough, the fourth one to Kettle, who died in the war, and uh, Connolly, and then uh, Will Redmond, uh, Redmond, and then the final verse, I think that only did the last couple of lines, but it's a brilliant verse, here's to you men I never met, yet hope to meet behind the veil, thronged on some starry parapet that looks down upon Innisfail, and sees the confluence of dreams that clash together in our night, one river born from many streams, rolling one by is a blinding light. And of course, that's, that's, that's one of his most forward-looking political uh, poems. And I'll, I'll finish the poetry bit just on um, a more spiritual one. Uh, there's a, there's a, a dusk and uh, out in the plains of Connemara. And A, the closeness to earth, his view of life and death, he nearly believed that every day was a living creature, a living thing, and it came to a natural end, a twilight, and then of course a new day, uh, and died, and a new day was born thereafter. We captured that thought in uh, the poem The Great Breath, uh, and I think the, pay the payoff line in that is actually the second verse. A shadowy tumult stirs the dusky air, Sparkle the delicate dews, the distant snows, the great deep thrills, for through it everywhere the breath of beauty blows. Yeah. So uh, that's just a short uh, one. I would say to people, I've, I've raced through um, the poetry, but I would say there's, there's poetry for everyone in A's catalogue, and I would just say in, in your own time, go and have a look for yourself, uh, and you know. You'll find one that means something to you. And I also found in my own case that uh, when you revisit a poem, you could read an AE poem for the first time and not make a lot of sense out of it and wonder what he has. Uh, you come along you know, a fortnight later, a month later, read the same thing, so make any drops, and you just get what he's at. Uh, and some of, some of it is beautiful. Um, some of it's hard work, but some of it's beautiful. And uh, it's amazing the way he's disappeared. To large extent, as a recognised poet in Ireland, when at one time he was one of Harvard Yeats. Uh, I, I myself, in terms of poetry, obviously prefer Yeats. I think Yeats is an incredible canon of poetry, but A's up there. Paintings. Again, the paintings were informed by the same kind, kinds of things, and some of them were simple, some of them were mystical, spiritual, some of them reflected his view of rural life, his view. Uh, of uh, rural workers, and he showed solidarity uh, with uh, with rural workers. Um, he also painted every year for 30 plus years up in Donegal near Marble Hill, and um, and he just painted simple scenes there. He stayed often with the Law family, the big house up there, and their children would be out playing and something. Just paint kids roaming about the beach or, or whatever. 
His PhD notes, but he did recall he's not here today. Uh, but David Kelly has this of to a T. Uh, she's got she is a complete expert on age painting. And they talk about the um, what is it, the iridescence and the, the, the they have a light and a glow to them. Obalescence. Obalescence that, um, that that the painting world recognizes. So I'll, I'll just flash up a few of them uh, just to see that. That looks, like, that looks like Marble Hill there. Um, there's the she appearing to uh, a girl in the in the middle of the countryside. Did you really could tell you that there's a hierarchy of fairies allegedly? Everyone can interpret for themselves what 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 they mean or what they signify. You can see, he's quite fond of stars always. Um, I'm not sure about that one, but that's what he saw, that's what he um, produced. Those are the kind of mystical ones, and I think there's earlier mention of a boat going across with wings and the goddess or whatever. And here we come to the, the dreaded three graces, <laughs> and, which I acquired. It's pastel, and uh, it's, uh, well, and there's doves. And I'm not quite sure entirely what it's about. Uh, I'd be interested in Jenny's thoughts on that. What, what kind of touched me about it was uh, it was a gift from A.E. to Hazel Lavery, uh, John Lavery's wife, and uh, mm -hmm. celebrated socialite and the lady on all, the early Irish oh. currency. Uh, uh, so uh, that's that one. Um, there's just a landscape, someone going through a passageway uh, path, mm. and that's Muckish Mountain in the background, which is not far from Marble Hill. Mm. Another landscape, probably up in Donegal. Um, mm. Just uh, did a lot of woodland scenes as well, and I think when you see those, I'm not sure that the, that the computer does them justice, but there's brilliant light in those. You really mm. can sense the light in the, in the glade in the forest. Slightly darker one. Quite similar actually to one that's on, um, if you were in TJ Flanagan's office in um, Plunkett House. Uh, he's got one like that on the wall. Then when, he come, then when he combines his belief in the she and the fairies with his commitment to rural Ireland and the rural worker. So there's the she or the goddess, complete with spear. But standing guard over the little homestead. Mm. Uh, then he returned to workers, and A, a um, uh, was a supporter of uh, rural workers, but also in particular rural women, who he thought were a raw deal, and without them, the men would be in caves. And he shows there's two men working, and they're making, not making a great job of lifting a log. <laughs> and uh, unlike the two ladies who are carrying a basket of stones and they're cooperating and it's making it easier and then we have the ladies here in the potato diggers and that if, for those who with musical memories um, that was the cover of the CD of A Woman's Heart which remains and that might have been A Woman's Heart too but the Woman's Heart remains the biggest selling CD in Ireland of all time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they chose A.E. because it was a woman's thing and he uh, was a champion of women's rights. In fact, in his time, he supported uh, the, uh, we call them the suffragettes. Yeah. And uh, he was the only Packers. kind of major figure in public life, male figure in public life. That did. There's another picture just from the beach, Donegal. And another one. Um, which it is very similar if you saw again TJ Flanagan's room. Yeah. Uh, that, I, I'm not sure if it's a, the exact same one, maybe, but because um, um, uh, there was a series of those. Um, the thing that drew me, I mean, I like all aspects of it, but the thing that drew me was just the, the, the depth of his personality. Uh, uh, to, to be in the thick of things the way he was, but not to be falling out with people, not to be trying to build position for himself, not to be selfish. Um, 
and uh, which used to frustrate me it's great like you said you only deal with your equals and your betters <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean you said some chocolate things uh, uh, he had wealthy in-laws uh, the Parsons in Sligo merchants shipping people and uh, they bought a big they built a big chunky new house in Sligo uh, and plenty of money and uh, yet said of it the measure of the quality of the family not the size of the house the length of the driveway up to it <laughs> and I think he ducked and dived a lot politically more to do with where he was with Maud gone than what he actually believed in um, so there was quite a contrast between the sincerity uh, of A and, and, and the kind of opportunism of Yeats and when you criticise Yeats it's taken as a given he was a brilliant poet and a powerful personality. Um, and then um, there's just what some people said about him. Uh, and the, the other thing is to write, I don't know of anyone who in their own life, while they were in their prime, attracted such praise from those around them. I mean, it, was, it, it embarrassed them, it was excessive. People get praised when they die, and the tributes and all the rest of it. He was getting it all the time. And, and, it, and people, you know, people who met him, we're talking as though it was some kind of life-changing experience as he sort of looked into their soul. And this sort of, I don't think any of that has been really explored adequately. Um, I'll finish just with the one that, that um, takes me most. Here's a guy who was um, Vice President of the United States under Roosevelt. And if you just look at the quotation on the right, and this is what the Vice President thought of it. Um, you know, it wasn't just here's, a guy, here's an Irish guy I like. <laughs> or here's an Irish guy who I think is clever. It, it, it's uh, you know, one of the finest, most gifted, most colourful people I ever knew. And how he spoke and so on. Um, so I leave it there, but I'd say, I'd say find your own way today. Go look at the paintings, go read, go read the poems and you'll find uh, something for yourself. Thanks. <coughs>